The Stone Cold Truth About Moon Rocks with Nicole Selner. Hello and welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this April Fool's Day, we're gonna bring you the Stone Cold Truth About Moon Rocks. No kidding. Later on, we're gonna be joined by Elvian College physics professor, Nicole Zellner, discussing her research on planetary impacts within our solar system, and maybe beyond. Now, throughout history, many cultures had myths and legends about the moon, but they didn't really develop a good scientific understanding of its composition. Now, some people believed it was made of a metal, perhaps silver, well, others held on to the belief that the moon was a god or goddess. Are you saying I am not a goddess? Uh, I'm sorry, Celine. However, 25 centuries ago, the ancient Greek philosopher Anaxagoras came to the radical and correct conclusion that the moon was made of rock. I rock. Now, this also correctly explained the reflection of light and eclipses of the sun and the moon. Naturally, for his brilliant insight, Anaxagoras was exiled from Athens permanently. Who needs Athens anyway? I retreated to Lampsicus, where I was treated as a celebrity. And now I have a crater named after me near the North Pole of the Moon. Not bad. Now, it wasn't until the development of the telescope in the early 17th century that scientists were able to observe the moon in detail and begin to study its composition. Now, over time, we discovered that the moon is primarily made up of rock and dust, along with some metals like, uring, uh, like iron or titanium. Uh, the Apollo missions of the 1960s and 70s returned to over 380 kilograms of lunar rocks to Earth. That's about the weight of a full-grown male grizzly bear and 40 bowling balls. What? I like bowling. Now, once on our home planet, scientists found lunar rocks and regoliths contain many of the same materials as Earth, including oxygen, silicon, and aluminum. Uh, one of the most surprising discoveries from the lunar samples was that the moon's composition is, in some ways, quite different from the Earth's. For example, rocks on the moon have a much lower iron content than Earth, uh, providing clues to our shared planetary story. Breaking news from the cosmos. Where else are you going to get news? Now this is really cool. New research that just came out as we are making this episode suggests impacts of asteroids and comets on the moon may have helped form water-rich glass beads. Now strewn, strewn throughout the lunar regolith just under the crust. Uh, next up, we're gonna go rock on with this idea with physics professor Nicole Zellner from Albion College. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Nicole Zellner. She is a physics professor at Albion College, and she studies planetary impacts and how they affected the Earth-Moon system. And welcome to the show, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So 
First of all, how did you begin your journey down to a life of science and become interested in rocks whizzing around our solar system? <laughs> Uh, well, I grew up um, in a small town in rural Wisconsin that had wonderful, beautiful, clear views of the night sky without any light pollution. And I just got enamored with the stars and celestial objects and um, found out I had a, had a good knack and skill set in math and science and, and found my way to the University of Wisconsin for my undergraduate degree and to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York for my graduate degree. And while I was in graduate school, um, a professor, um, John Delano, introduced this idea, this topic that you could uh, understand bombardment in the solar system by investigating lunar impact glasses that were brought to Earth by the Apollo astronauts in the regolith samples from each of the Apollo sites. And I thought that this was a really cool project that would allow us to understand some really big picture ideas about the origin of pollution in our solar system, and in particular in the Earth-Moon system, and how these impacts could have brought necessary biomolecules to a young habitable Earth, um, as well as um, the impact flux, understanding the impact flux on the earth and what that can do for evolution and extinction of, of animals and species over time. And it, it just really, I don't know, it just re really got me um, thinking about looking at these billions of year old samples that were collected before I was born um, and being able to send them to answer some, some big questions. Wow, so that's so cool. Can you bring us back? I mean, what's a better place to start than the beginning of things? <laughs> Can you bring us back to the early solar system and how these asteroids and proto asteroids, proto comets whizzing around helped helped uh, help shape our world? Sure. So uh, four and a half billion years ago, um, our solar system formed when a molecular cloud collapsed and debris started circling around it, orbiting around it, that debris got bigger and bigger and gravity took over and we started having planets and planetesimals forming in our solar system. But while the solar system was trying to figure out how to be stable while the planets and moons were still figuring out their orbits and where their um, where the best place was, for lack of a better phrase, um, to be orbiting around the sun, there are lots and lots of collisions happening. Um, the gas giant planets in particular were migrating from their points of origin to their present locations. And in those migration, um, in those migrations, asteroids were being jostled out of position in the asteroid belt and comets were being jostled out of position in the Kuiper belt falling into the inner solar system because of the sun's gravity and then impacting the planets that got in the way of their orbits. Hmm. So we know that this um, uh, migration of the gas giant planets happened fairly early on in solar system history. And so uh, those of us who are interested in the dynamical evolution of our solar system are really concentrating in the first billion years or so after our solar system formed to try to piece together how big the impacts were, um, how frequent they were, and what kinds of ingredients, they biomolecules, for example, they might have brought to the early Earth and, and also Mars. Hmm. So you, you've hit on my next question. How could this have helped kick off life on Earth and possibly Mars? And maybe yes. a week and a half on Venus. For <laughs> <Right. laughs> a small time on Venus. Well, we know that comets and asteroids contain, um, a possess, I should say, uh, biomolecules like amino acids and sugars and a lot of the ingredients that were necessary for starting materials for life on Earth as we know it. And, um, and we know through impact experiments, including some of the work that we've done here at Albion College with undergraduate students, that those molecules can actually survive impact and can become a little bit more complex. So under the right conditions, under the right temperature, the right H, um, the right pressures, those biomolecules can come together and start forming the very first um, um, uh, 
biomolecules or, or, and be available for life as we know it. We think that may have happened fairly soon after Earth formed, maybe around 600 to 700 million years after Earth formed, we're starting to get the very first evidence for life on Earth. Hmm. And so what, when you're looking at these moon rocks, you know, the ones brought back from Apollo or possibly, you know, pieces which have survived our uh, travel <laughs> through our atmosphere, um, what, what do those rocks, what do those moon rocks teach you about, about uh, the development of the Earth and the moon? So I actually look at um, microscopic pieces of glass that are formed in impact events. So when, um, like we get uh, glass from melting sand on earth, we get glass on the moon when the regolith gets melted under these very high temperature impact events. Um, those glasses as well as the Apollo rock um, that were returned by the astronauts um, have chemical compositions that are similar to earth compositions, a little bit different in the isotopes, however. So we know that they've undergone some some different sorts of um, um, evolutionary histories compared to some of the earth rocks. The glasses possess a chemical composition of where they were formed and also when they were formed. And so by investigating those, um, those, those pieces of evidence, we can start to fill in a timeline for bombardment um, on the moon. And then by proxy, because the moon is so close to earth, we can infer what the bombardment history of the earth is. That's in the impact glasses. We also have impact mount rock um, that can tell us similar information. And we have volcanic rocks from the moon that can give us information about when the moon was geologically active. But it, importantly, the rocks that were brought back by the um, Apollo astronauts have actually linked the origin of the moon with a giant impact on the earth um, shortly after earth formed. And so by getting those samples from the moon, we were able to piece together the origin of the moon and then the subsequent history and evolution of the moon. So it, it was pretty exciting um, uh, what we have in our Apollo collection to help us understand the moon's origin and evolution. Mm. And of course, we'll be getting more samples, hopefully, over the next few years from Artemis. Very, very excited about the Artemis program. Artemis, of course, is the twin sister of Apollo, mm -hmm. and it's uh, NASA's um, next generation lunar exploration. Uh, so we're very excited to be heading back to the heading back to the moon, uh, landing the first woman and the first person of color on the moon as astronauts and really opening up lunar exploration for an entire new generation and more of, of, of lunar explorers and investigators. Absolutely. Let's hear it for the Artemis generation. Um, and so another really exciting event, something that I've been following for a couple of years, several years, is uh, are the asteroid return missions. Uh, the Hoyabusa 2 mission recently dropped off samples from, you know, big samples from asteroids, and relatively large. Um, and, of course, later this year, OSIRIS-REx will be dropping another sample off. And so yeah. are you hoping, what are you hoping to get uh, from, the inf from the data from these samples of ancient asteroids to help teach you, to help learn more about planetary and lunar impacts. Yeah, so um, the asteroids exist further away um, from the Earth than the moon does in the asteroid belt between Earth and Mars. Um, and these asteroids in particular are very primitive. Um, we don't think that they've undergone a lot of processing um, in their four and a half billion year history. And so um, they will likely have some impact samples in them, probably not glasses, but maybe. Um, but in particular, their chemical compositions will tell us about formation conditions of the early solar system because they, they're, they're fairly well preserved. And so um, they'll, they'll probably have um, organic molecules on them as well, which can help us understand alteration histories and where in the solar system and under what kinds of conditions in the solar system these organic molecules like amino acids and sugars um, could actually form. So, uh, uh, so aside from giving us the composition of the asteroid um, and telling us about the composition of the early solar system, they're going to give us some of this um, other kinds of information as well. So again, just really 
cool information that can help piece together a timeline for interesting events happening in our solar system. Mm. And one of the great things, one of the things I really love about science, and most of the scientists I've talked to love this as well, is how science changes its mind <laughs> when presented with better evidence. All right. So how, what would you think, you know, over, and of course, our ideas about the moon have changed radically over the last 60 years, 100 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what would you what would you say are some of the biggest changes in our mindset in our, and in our understanding about lunar rocks and lunar glasses? And yeah, so I think one of the biggest um, discoveries is that the moon is not bone dry. Uh, for years and years, decades, we thought that the moon. Uh, didn't have any water on it or in it or ever. And uh, the lunar volcanic glasses were actually investigated by a group at Brown University and evidence for water was found inside of those lunar volcanic glasses, which tells us that there was some kind of a liquid reservoir uh, inside the moon when the moon was geologically active. Um, we have also gotten some really great orbital data from various orbiters, the Lunar Prospector and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, for example, that are showing us evidence for water, water ice in the permanently shadowed regions of the lunar craters. Um, so these are called PSRs, permanently shadowed regions. And this is going to be great for a sustained human settlement on the moon because now we have a water supply or water source. We still have to figure out the best way to extract that water and, and how we're going to use it. Um, but we know that in these permanently shadowed regions on the moon, there does exist a water supply. So I think water on the moon was probably one of the biggest game changers um, that, that came out of the Apollo um, samples, as well as the orbiters that we have um, circling the moon right now. Hmm. And we, of course, learned so much about the beginnings of life on Earth from looking mm -hmm. at moon rocks and these lunar glasses and impact events. But what do you think these studies could teach us about the possibility of life on other worlds, on exoplanets, say? <laughs> or even Europa, you know? Yeah. Well, I think we have to be a little bit careful because um, the, the, the preservation of organic materials in the moon is pretty slim. Um, but rather, what we're learning from the moon um, tells us about the impact rate in the Earth-Moon system. Um, not, and it's, it's telling us that big things happen, big events happen, big life-changing, life-ending impacts happen. But when we look at the terrestrial biological record, we see life has been continuous since probably at 3.9 billion years ago, if not earlier than that. So despite the constant bombardment, despite the big things hitting Earth and, and causing a really bad day, um, uh, life persists. Uh, there are niches life is, that life can exploit and find preservation within. And I think that um, if we wanted to extend that out to, to other planets, to exoplanets, we can presume that those planetary systems underwent some sort of similar bombardment, probably some sort of similar migration of gas giants, some sort of similar jostling of their own asteroid belts and their own Kuiper belts, we think. Um, and, and should there have been or still be any life on those planets? If it's similar to life as we know on, on Earth, it should or could have been quite robust and survived through those very bad days caused by impacts. And that is me being very optimistic and very <laughs> creative and imaginative because each of these exoplanet systems is different, right. right? They're very different and they're very different from what we have here in our solar system. So trying to make that leap, to make that extension from what we know here to those exoplanets um, requires a lot of um, optimism, I think. 
I think I think we could probably all use a little optimism these days. <laughs> right. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. All right. So finally, in addition to all your amazing work with science, you have also been a dancer all your life. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so how how does the arts help us appreciate the cosmos? Oh, that is a really great question. I think that um, I like to quote Mariah Mitchell, uh, a female astronomer from the 1800s here in the United States. And she says that um, she has said, and this is a very bad paraphrasing, that science is not just logic and math, but it is also be beauty and poetry. And I think that we have to have a good imagination to be able to interpret the data um, in ways that um, allow us to, to, to think beyond uh, pure numbers. Um, I think that being creative, whether it's dancing or music or theater or poetry uh, linguistically, I think being creative allows us to have a more holistic view on what the data are telling us and allow us to place that data in a very much larger context and make sure all the pieces kind of fit together and fit together nicely and tell a story. And I think that's where being creative and being a scientist can be advantageous um, to making progress in this field. Uh, well, thanks so much for being on the show, Nicole. It was fabulous talking with you. Thank you so much. It was great to talk a little science today. and. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that your listeners might have, and please feel free to share my contact info. All right, absolutely, will do. And that was Nicole Zellner, physics professor at Albion College and Clear Skies. On the 5th of November, 2019, NASA opened up a vial containing rocks and dust collected by Apollo astronauts Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt back in December of 1972. But then in perspective, this material was sealed around the same time as the Johnny Rivers hit rocking pneumonia and the Boogie Woogie flu was topping the charts and was unsealed when Billie Eilish and Halsey were ruling the airwaves. The Artemis program, like Apollo, aims to gather rocks and lunar regolith and bring them back to Earth for analysis. All right, so if you're bringing any payload to space, that's going to require more fuel for the booster rocket, adding more mass, which means you need more fuel to get to space, which adds more mass, which means that... We get it already. It's just easier to go to the moon, get rocks, and bring them to uh, laboratories on Earth than it is to launch point. a laboratory to the moon. Now, researchers have also examined the lunar surface from above from orbit above the moon using the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and other spacecraft. Following three years in a low polar orbit uh, LRO uh, transition to a stable elliptical orbit making low passes over the moon's southernmost region. Now, uh, the south pole of the moon is thought to be home to the most precious resource we could possibly find on the lunar surface. Water. Large quantities of water ice stored in ancient glaciers is thought to hide in the eternal shadows inside deep craters at the poles of the moon. Now, water comes in mighty handy for drinking and for washing. And watering plants. Why does no one You're ever right. talk about the and plants? plants. I mean, huh, leave it to you. Now, if you think back to middle school science class, you'll recall that water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, the, wa the hydrogen can be used for fuel, since it can be explosive! Oops. With water, oxygen, and fuel, the moon's south pole is going to be a popular place of real estate. <laughs> You can already hear the debates now about whether or not to introduce an upscale resort near the lunar habitats. All that overpriced, over-roasted coffee, medium-sized clothing chains, and cilantro on everything! Oxygen is also helpful if one enjoys, you know, 
breathing. Surprisingly though, the most common element on the moon is in fact oxygen. It's found in silica, lumina, lime, iron oxide, magnesia, titanium. Enough. Get on yeah. with it. Uh, China, China's Chang'e program is also exploring the moon and that nation has announced plans to work with Russia building an international habitat near the lunar south pole. All this is made possible because of what we've learned from studying moon rocks. Pretty cool, huh? Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we'll be exploring extraterrestrial life through science and science fiction. We're going to have our first ever triple interview with Julie Novakova, Giovanni Pagali, and Eric Choi talking about their new anthology, Life Beyond Us. This work, pairing original science fiction stories with scientific essays, explores the possibilities of life beyond our planet. Make sure to join us starting on the 8th of April. You're going to find it wherever you found this episode of the show, right? Moon will. So, if you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please download and share it any place you share stuff. I'm not fussy. Head on over to thecosmiccompanion.net for more episodes. Or subscribe to our newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode. Blair Skies!